as the Council of Constance had condemned John Wycliffe. It also condemned one of his most notable followers, a passionate reformer in Bohemia named Jan Hus, whose disciples were called Hussites. Inspired by Wycliffe, Hus opposed the doctrine of papal infallibility and asserted the authority of the Bible over the opinions of church leaders. As a result, he was condemned as a heretic and burned at the stake in 1415. But before he died, he claimed that God had given him a promise. The name Hus means goose in the Czech language. And so the Lord had told him, they will silence the goose, but in 100 years, I will raise a swan from your ashes that no one will be able to silence. A century later, inspired in part by the sermons of Hus, Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, an event that would launch the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. While it is often thought that the Reformation was somehow an anti-Catholic movement, the reality is that most of the reformers began as Catholic priests. All these guys originally were Roman Catholic priests. Uh, uh, Wycliffe was a Roman Catholic priest, but he came to know Christ as his savior and that changed his theology. Uh, and then the same way with William Tyndall. Uh, he was defrocked there in Valvord Castle. He was a Roman Catholic priest. The same was true of Jan Hus and others such as John Knox, Ulrich Zwingli, and most famously, Martin Luther. It might be said that Luther had broken the dam of a great flood that had been gathering for centuries because of the controversies with the Albigenses and the Waldenses, because of John Wycliffe and Jan Hus and Jerome of Prague, a friend of Hus who, with many others, were condemned by Rome and burned at the stake for reading and believing the Holy Scriptures. There can be no question that the Bible itself was the weapon of choice used by the reformers who took up the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Yet there were certain conditions that came about in Luther's time that made a reformation possible, not just in Germany, but throughout all Europe. One of them was the invention of movable type by a man named Johann Gutenberg in 1440. Johann Gutenberg, who has invented not the printing press, but the movable type that you could take apart, put back together. Gutenberg started out as a goldsmith. There had been printing on wood blocks uh, for quite some time, but he makes it easy because you can make type and then reformat that type. And so they start producing uh, numerous books of the Reformation, numerous Bibles of the Reformation. Prior to Gutenberg's invention, producing just one Bible took the average scribe some 10 months to copy. But in 1455, Johann Gutenberg published the now famous Gutenberg Bible, along with 200 copies in a single year. For centuries, Rome had been burning Bibles, along with the books written by men like Wycliffe and others. But now, these books could be reproduced at unprecedented levels. And that's why Luther could have such an influence. That's why Tyndale could have such an influence. That's why just books were starting to be printed that uh, a scribe didn't have to sit down in 10 months to, to do a Wycliffe Bible. You could do it in a matter of weeks now, a bunch of them, and, and get them out. So boy, that's what really uh, fueled the Reformation. Gutenberg's first Bible was based on the Latin Vulgate, originally translated by Jerome in the fourth century. Vulgate simply means vulgar, the common, common language. John Wycliffe's translation had also been based on Latin manuscripts, although it has been disputed what manuscripts they were. Yet Wycliffe and others acknowledged that the original writings of the Bible were mostly in Hebrew and Greek. 
The Jewish scribes had carefully preserved the writings of the Old Testament in the Hebrew language with selective passages in Aramaic. Meanwhile, the writings of the New Testament were recorded in Koine Greek. Which brings us to the second great event that brought forth the Reformation, the fall of Constantinople in 1453. The city of Constantinople was so named because it had been built by Constantine the Great in the fourth century and was originally intended to replace Rome as the capital of the empire. But after Constantine's death, the Roman Empire was divided east and west. While the West was primarily dominated with Latin as their earliest form of scripture, in the East, the people continued to read, write, and speak in Greek. In time, they would be known as the Byzantine Empire. Then in 1453, the Ottoman Turks led by the Islamic Sultan, Mehmed II, conquered Constantinople in a victory that stunned the Western world. As a result, many of the Byzantine scholars fled into the West, bringing with them thousands of ancient Greek manuscripts, including many copies of the Greek New Testament. Yeah, you had them fleeing and taking their manuscripts with them, so uh, you, you have uh, uh, Mohammedism coming in, the Ottoman Turks coming in, and they're, they're taking over, so they're fleeing to Western Europe. In the years that would follow, many of these Byzantine scholars would begin teaching the Greek language in the universities of Europe. One of them was a man named George Hermonymus, or Hermonymus of Sparta. It's said that he was the first person to teach Greek at the University of Sorbonne in Paris. Among his famous students was the great intellectual Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam. The Reformation gathered momentum and indeed was sustained by the work of uh, the great scholar Erasmus who produced the uh, first Greek New Testament as a single edition. For Erasmus and many scholars of the time, the introduction of the Greek New Testament into the Western world opened a whole new understanding of the Bible. And Erasmus uh, works about the different manuscripts in different languages, and was one of the novelties of this book because as we can open this book, we can immediately uh, see that uh, we have on the same page, two different texts. One is the version, version of the, the Greek text, and at the right, the column with the Latin text. And this form of this text was very, very radical at the time of Erasmus, because uh, at the time of Erasmus, the man has the, uh, usually published this text only with the Latin text. Erasmus, Erasmus was the first in 1516 to publish uh, the two texts on the same page. It was revolutionary for this time because the men of this time came to compare the original and the translation of Erasmus. And that modified the system of the religious thinking of this time. The religious thinking that was modified had to do with a more in-depth and detailed understanding of the Word of God. Erasmus wrote that Latin scholarship, however elaborate, is maimed and reduced by half without Greek. For whereas we Latins have but a few small streams, a few muddy pools, the Greek possess crystal clear springs and rivers that run with gold. When the Greek manuscripts became available and scholars began to compare the Vulgate against the Greek, it became very evident very quickly that the Vulgate went off in its own direction. Erasmus says that the Vulgate was so corrupt, he made a completely new translation of the Latin based upon the Greek, and people who could read Latin 
read uh, Erasmus's Latin text and the Latin Vulgate of the Roman Catholic Church, they said, whoa, <laughs> this doesn't agree. Erasmus recognized that what he uncovered through the Greek and what he would write about would strike at the very heart of Catholic tradition. And we can also uh, read on the title page, Quis quis igitur amas viriam the theologiam. That, that, that mean uh, everybody, they love the real theology. Lege cognosce adeinde judica. That was also very typical of Erasmus. I, I want to say to the new lectors of this time, you must first lege, uh, um, read, uh, cognosce, you must understand. And after Agdeinde, and after only, you must uh, uh, an opinion, a new opinion uh, have about my works. It was Erasmus who confronted certain key corruptions in the Latin text, translations that had greatly affected the understanding of the Christian faith. For instance, there's a whole big difference between the word penance and repentance. And Jesus says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Well, it had gotten translated in the Latin, except you do penance, you, all, you shall all likewise perish. Well, Erasmus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And not to get in the doctrinal things, but there's a whole big difference between repentance towards God and doing penance on the part of a man. Penance, according to the Catholic Church, is a sacrament that requires absolution from a Catholic priest. Before granting this forgiveness, the priest may require fasting, almsgiving, prayer, or some other labor on the part of the person being forgiven. The Council of Trent stated that we are by no means able to arrive by the sacrament of penance without many tears and labors on our part. Yet the word repent carries with it a different meaning, a change of heart and mind, to turn away from sin and toward faith in God. And so, as one author puts it, because of Erasmus, the church's complex and somewhat cumbersome mechanics of penance was thus converted at a stroke into a simple demand for a personal change of heart. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Erasmus also discovered another major corruption in the Latin, one that pertained to the Virgin Mary. For centuries, it had been believed that Mary was somehow in charge of the grace of God. The reason is because of the Latin translation of Luke chapter 1, where the angel Gabriel announces the birth of Christ to Mary. The Latin Vulgate reads, And the angel went in and said to her, Hail, O one that is full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Church historian Alistair McGrath writes that, the angelic words in Latin were often interpreted in the Middle Ages as meaning that Mary was like a reservoir, full of God's grace. She could, therefore, be a source of God's grace to those who needed it and who could access this grace through prayer to her. But McGrath says that Erasmus was scathing about this translation. The words of the angel could not possibly be translated as hail, O one that is full of grace. Perhaps it could be rendered, hail, O one that has found grace, or hampered one. The implication of the passage was that Mary had found God's favor, not that she could bestow that favor on others. Still, some Catholics, like Louise Marie de Montfort, whose writings inspired Pope John Paul II, took the Latin reading to an extreme asserting that all grace 
comes only through Mary. Yet in the Greek New Testament, we are told that it is Jesus, not Mary, who is full of grace and truth. Needless to say, Erasmus' discoveries in the Greek manuscripts were like a bombshell impacting the Church of the Middle Ages. The crystal clear springs of knowledge that he wrote of laid the groundwork for the Reformation that would follow. In addition to his Greek text, Erasmus wrote extensively against the immorality of the priesthood at that time, condemning the Inquisition and teaching that the Bible should be read by all. Meanwhile, Martin Luther had discovered Romans chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul says, The just shall live by faith. Luther, who had spent years as a monk, struggling to please God through penance and the works of Catholicism, realized that, according to the Bible, men could only be justified by God's grace, His free gift, through faith in Christ alone. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Armed with the newly revealed Greek text published by Erasmus, Luther would produce a German translation of the New Testament in 1522. And so it would be said that Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. Let's remember that uh, Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, uh, he went far and wide collecting manuscripts and manuscript reading. What he did is he went and collected readings and read manuscripts and wrote down portions of them. And then what he does is brings those all together and in 1516 uh, he publishes his first edition, but it was done kind of hastily. Uh, and so uh, he does another one in 1519, and it's the 1519 edition that um, it's the 1519 edition that Martin Luther uses for his September Bible of 1522, and then his 1522 edition is the one that William Tyndale uses in 1526 to give us our English Bible.